SpaceX is entering the final stages of preparations for Starship's third integrated flight test. The FAA has recently disclosed vital details regarding the launch license, and the launch site is undergoing significant upgrades. Notably, SpaceX has initiated the prefabrication of sections for the second Starship launch tower at their production site. Stay with us as we explore these latest updates in detail. Starship 28 and Super Heavy Booster 10 are currently undergoing a rigorous final processing phase to ensure their readiness for the imminent third integrated flight test. After completing the installation of the remaining thermal protection system tiles, extensive system checks, intricate engine inspections, and comprehensive assembly verifications, Ship 28 moved out of the high bay on Wednesday night. However, the ship was later taken back into the high bay. As of now, Ship 28 is positioned on its transport stand, signaling the completion of all pre-launch system checks and preparing it for its imminent journey to the launch site. Meanwhile, Booster 10 remains inside the Mega Bay, undergoing the final stages of processing. Both the ship and the booster are expected to roll out to the launch site by late January or early February. Upon their return to the launch site, Ship 28 will be stacked atop Booster 10, setting the grand stage for the eagerly anticipated flight test. The traditional wet dress rehearsal might be bypassed, given SpaceX's confidence in the thorough preparation, allowing for a seamless transition to the launch phase. The company is still waiting for the green signal from the Federal Aviation Administration for the launch. As per SpaceX officials, they expect to receive the launch license next month. An FAA spokesperson, responding to a LabPodre team member's inquiry via email, confirms that SpaceX has submitted its Flight 2 mishap investigation report for agency review. Additionally, modifications for the Flight 3 launch license are underway. The FAA will make a license determination upon satisfaction that SpaceX has met all safety, environmental, policy, and financial responsibility requirements. Work to get the launch pad ready for Flight 3 is nearing completion. The final round of launch mount inspections and repair work is underway. The focus is on the 20 booster hold-down clamps, ensuring their optimum functionality during launch. Moreover, the quick disconnect ports, responsible for delivering gases for the outer 20 booster engine startup, and the main booster quick disconnect mechanism, are being thoroughly examined for seamless operation. Teams are also working on the ship quick disconnect mechanism that allows the flow of propellants, gases, electric power, and communication signals to the upper stage on the launch day. The launch mount and the launch tower were purged with liquid nitrogen lately, ensuring the efficient performance of propellant lines and associated components. Work is also underway to add upgrades to the launch tower ahead of Flight 3. The concrete base of the launch tower is getting steel panel protection to better handle the intense heat and shock waves generated during launches. This strategic reinforcement not only aims to mitigate the potential for concrete erosion caused by the extreme conditions of launches, but also contributes to the overall resilience of the launch infrastructure. The decision for this additional protection likely stems from the significant impacts observed during the first two launches. A new concrete blast wall is also being installed between the launch mount and the orbital tank farm. This decision was due to the observed limitations of the previous HESCO barrier, which proved insufficient against a formidable power generated by the 33 Raptor engines. Tank farm expansion continues as new horizontal propellant tanks are delivered to the launch site. The recently delivered horizontal tanks are the 7th and 8th tanks designed to store propellants for future launch and rocket testing activities at the launch pad. One more horizontal tank is expected to be delivered in the coming days. It appears that there may be a shift in SpaceX's plans regarding the fate of the vertical tanks at the launch site. Two weeks ago, SpaceX removed and scrapped two of the eight vertical storage tanks. Recently, workers began reinforcing two of the remaining six tanks with external supports. The tanks that are being reinforced are one of the two liquid nitrogen storage tanks and the old methane storage tank, which was later repurposed to store water. The reinforcement includes the installation of large vertical supports with cross bracings to safeguard the tanks from impacts during launches. Dent removal tools are being employed to address dents caused by impacts from the first two integrated flight tests. It looks like they are working to weld the tanks with the vertical supports. This meticulous process to reinforce the structural integrity of the tanks aims to ensure they can withstand the dynamic forces experienced during launches and other operational activities at the site. While earlier reports suggested the intention to scrap all vertical tanks and utilize newly installed horizontal tanks for liquid nitrogen and oxygen storage, these recent developments suggest a potential shift in strategy. The possibility arises that the vertical tanks might not be scrapped entirely, but some of them could potentially be repurposed for specific functions, such as storing water. 
Given the need for water for various launch site activities, including the launch mount fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system, and heat exchangers at the tank farm, repurposing vertical tanks for water storage could serve practical purposes. The final decision on the fate of the vertical tanks will likely depend on SpaceX's evolving requirements and strategies. SpaceX began work to manufacture sections for the second launch tower at Starbase. Footings have been installed at the Sanchez area of the production site to prefabricate the tower sections. A Starship launch tower comprises nine prefabricated segments, and SpaceX has already completed seven of them at the Kennedy Space Center facility. One of them arrived at Starbase last month on a barge, with the remaining six to follow soon. The eighth and ninth segments will be prefabricated at Starbase from these pieces assembled in the Sanchez area. All nine segments will then be stacked to complete the launch tower. According to the 2020 Starbase launch site expansion plan, the new tower will be positioned in proximity to the existing launch tower. Once completed, SpaceX will equip the tower with rocket stacking and catching arms, along with the ship quick disconnect mechanism. Concurrently, work on the second orbital launch mount will progress alongside tower construction. Both the second launch tower at Starbase and the launch tower under construction at Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A are integral to increasing Starship launch frequency, aligning with Elon Musk's ambitious goal of colonizing Mars in the future. We're going to really be launching a lot, and, up, and we're going to be upgrading one tower while we launch from another tower, so two towers is important. Let's dive into the current status of the Starship and Super Heavy prototypes under development at the production site. Super Heavy Booster 12, having recently completed its cryogenic proof test campaign, was relocated into the Mega Bay last Tuesday night. Following engine installation, it will proceed to static fire testing. Additionally, inside the Mega Bay, we have Booster 11 on the engine installation stand. The Mega Bay also houses the fully stacked liquid oxygen tank section of Booster 13. Stacking of Booster 13's liquid methane tank began a week ago. Once the methane tank is assembled, it will be stacked atop the oxygen tank to complete the booster. Starship 29 is inside Mega Bay 2, while ships 30 and 31 are inside the high bay. Starship 32, the final Starship version 1 prototype, is at the Rocket Garden. Moving forward, ships from 33 onwards will introduce major design improvements and upgrades, marking the advent of the second generation of Starship prototypes, named Starship version 2s. V-2 ships would feature increased propellant capacity, reduced dry mass, and numerous design modifications. Following the V-2 series, Starship V-3 variants will emerge, towering 20 to 30 meters above the current generation, bringing the integrated launch vehicle height to approximately 140 to 150 meters. Starship V-3s will exhibit more than three times the power of NASA's Saturn V rockets and achieve a thousand-fold increase in mass-to-orbit capability compared to current Starship variants. I mean, the Starship is uh, more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. You know, with, with some upgrades down the road, it'll, it'll actually be, I think, probably over 20 million pounds of thrust. Um, and Saturn V is seven and a half. So it, it'll, it'll end up being three times the thrust of Saturn V. Like I said, the, 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 the mass to orbit ultimately of Starship will be more than a thousand times greater than uh, mass to orbit currently. Please check out my previous episodes to learn about Starship V2s and V3s in detail. Links are in the description. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Japan's slim lander has been forced to power down on the moon, but the mission team hope remains that the spacecraft can be reactivated. SLIM, short for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, was launched on September 7 atop an H-2A rocket from Japan's Tanegashima Space Center, along with the CRISM Space Telescope. Following an elongated, slow, fuel-efficient 110-day trip to the moon, the 700-kilogram spacecraft entered lunar orbit on December 25. SLIM performed a crucial engine burn on January 14, circularizing its orbit at the 600-kilometer altitude and setting the stage for descent and landing operations. The main goal of SLIM was to demonstrate advanced navigation and radar systems for a pinpoint landing within 100 meters of the target, the Shioli Crater. Shioli is an impact crater about 300 meters wide and has important scientific potential, including the suspected presence of the mineral olivine. Everything appeared to go smoothly on the day of landing, with SLIM hitting its various milestones during the descent. The spacecraft flipped from a horizontal to vertical orientation right on time and slowly dropped toward the lunar surface. However, the spacecraft suffered an anomaly during descent, which caused terminal damage to one of the two main engines. Despite the loss of one engine, the craft was still able to descend safely. 
Eventually, Slim successfully touched down in the Shioli crater, about 55 meters from the target, making Japan the fifth country to soft land on the moon. However, the uneven thrust resulting from the engine failure caused Slim to tilt into a nose-down attitude, orienting its solar panels westward and hindering the spacecraft from receiving sufficient sunlight to power its systems. Slim managed to establish contact with the Earth station while it ran on battery power. JAXA stated that they managed to obtain a lot of data from the spacecraft before it was powered down to prevent over-discharge. Slim teams hope that as the sun's position in the sky changes in the coming days, the spacecraft can receive sunlight and generate power. If it can be reawakened, Slim will attempt to fulfill its remaining mission goals, including extended operations on the lunar surface and acquiring scientific data. Just before landing, Slim released two small probes called the Lunar Excursion Vehicles. This pair will record the condition of the landing site and perform an engineering demonstration of autonomous exploration across the surface. The X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, or CRISM, launched along with the SLIM lander, is currently in its formal commissioning phase, which is expected to wrap up by the end of the month. Equipped with two instruments, Resolve and Extend, the telescope is designed to operate from a 550 km low Earth orbit and observe X-ray sources in the universe. Please check out my previous episode to learn about CRISM in detail. Link in the description. Sierra Space, a commercial space company headquartered in Louisville, Colorado, has successfully pressure-tested an inflatable module it is developing for commercial space stations. On January 22, Sierra Space announced that it performed a burst test of a full-sized version of its Large Integrated Flexible Environment, or LIFE module, on a test stand at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. As the name suggests, the purpose of the ultimate burst pressure test was to inflate the unit until it burst. The 8.2-meter inflatable structure burst at 77 psi, or 5.3 bar, proving that it exceeded NASA's recommended safety level of 60.8 psi, which is four times the module's maximum operating pressure of 15.2 psi. The test of the full-sized LIFE module comes after Sierra Space performed a series of subscale tests of the technology. The main purpose of the burst tests was to demonstrate the performance of the restraint layer, or pressure shell, of the module. That layer is made of straps of Vectron, a high-strength fiber, along with other fabrics. Life is intended to be one of Sierra Space's contributions to Orbital Reef, the commercial space station being developed with Blue Origin and other partners. The module is designed to fit within a 5-meter payload fairing at launch and then inflate once in orbit. When fully expanded, the module will have a volume of 300 cubic meters, about one-third the habitable volume of the International Space Station. Sierra Space has proposed a larger version of LIFE, designed to fit into a 7-meter payload fairing, with a volume of 1,400 cubic meters. This would surpass the size of the ISS in a single launch. Building upon the latest successful full-scale burst test, Sierra Space will embark on an aggressive 2024 testing campaign at both sub- and full-scale. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.